Hey, thanks for joining us here on 9 News Plus. I'm Chris Bianchi here with 9 News medical expert, Dr. Pyle Coley, for a bit more about the bivalent as uh, booster and how it's doing, and also uh, a bit more about COVID and as a whole, because, you know, it's something we haven't really touched on that much. And I still think maybe, um, I'm sure you would probably agree that maybe it's getting not as much attention as it probably should be. I know people are tired of it, but it's still, um, still an issue, isn't it? It's still very real, Chris. I mean, we're still seeing hundreds of lives every day being lost to COVID-19. We're seeing a stagnation in the use of treatments. Um, and, you know, with the, with the White House suggesting that they might actually lift the public health emergency, we might even see less testing, less mm. availability of treatments, less access to many of those resources that we've had. Yeah, so when you're talking about the public health emergency, which the White House uh, may, may, is looking to do, it looks like, over the course of the next few months, what does that mean for the average person? Yeah, so it means a couple of things. First, it means is that the politicians are saying now it is time to stop funding COVID, uh, and that means less access to free tests for the uninsured, even for those of us with insurance. It also means potentially less access to free vaccinations, to free treatments like Paxlovid, some of the monoclonal antibodies, depending on the variant that you got. Uh, and it could also mean, you know, even other things that you might not think about, like food stamps. For example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, they had allowed for, you know, high level of food stamps. So that benefit might go down. Many more people who were getting Medicaid under that public health emergency will now lose those benefits. So to me, it's going to be a huge shift in our day-to-day -day life, the way we consume healthcare in general, but also in how we think about COVID. And so with that looming on the horizon, when that happens and those resources go away, we have to be even more cognizant of the fact that we have to protect ourselves as individuals because we don't have many of those, you know, federal and governmental resources behind us if we were to get sick. And of course, one of those main ones, the vaccinations. Um, kind of want to specifically talk about the bivalent booster and what do we know about it and how's it working? So the bivalent booster was designed to have kind of two different strains of the virus, hence the name bivalent instead of monovalent. Hmm. So it had the original Wuhan, Wuhan strain, which was the original virus, and then they added the Omicron strain. And the idea was to create a breadth and a depth of your immune response so that you're getting kind of the, the, the original strain, which was the parent to kind of all the subvariants, and you're getting the most recent circulating strain, the Omicron, so that you're kind of getting antibody responses against both. Now, that was a theoretical idea. What we're seeing in some of the studies that have been published is that it, it's still better Bivalent is better than, than the previous monovalent ones with just the Wuhan, but it's not performing as well as we had hoped or expected for. Uh, hmm. And there could be many different reasons for that. And what I mean by that is that the level to which it boosts your antibody response, we're not seeing as robust a response hmm. as we thought we might see. Now, this could actually have worked against us by putting two strains to bivalent together because basically what the immune system might be doing is busy making antibodies to the one that it already knows, which is that original Wuhan strain, not making as many antibodies to the new one, hmm. which is Omicron variant. So maybe we've distracted our immune system too much by giving it two tasks instead of giving it one. That's one theory. The other theory is, you know, immune fatigue. The more that you boost the immune system, is it possible that your immune system's just kind of getting tired and saying, hmm, I've seen this before. I'm not going to make that much antibodies to it this time. And so it's not creating as robust an antibody response as it could have. That's another possible theory. The other thing is, is there a dissociation or difference between circulating antibodies and how much protection we, we actually have? And what I mean by that is, you know, our, our soldiers, which are the antibodies, are not out on patrol, but that doesn't mean they're not available Hmm. to go and fight if they need to be. So they could be living in our lymph nodes and not necessarily be circulating. So we may not have high levels of circulating antibodies, but we could still have reasonable protection. Um, and then finally, do the, does the response go away? And how quickly does it go away? We're seeing with the bivalent boosters peak response at about four weeks hmm. after get receiving the, the booster. But within a few months, we do start to see some of those antibodies wane. So it only seeming to last a few months. Now, it does, like I said, in the New England Journal of Medicine, they published uh, an update based on the current kind of milieu of the virus that's circulating. It has pretty good protection, of course, better than the monovalent. But again, with some of the caveats we discussed. Um, are we heading to a world or a likelihood that we're going to be getting COVID shots a la a flu shot every year? I think so. And then the FDA has recently green-lighted this. And I think some of the things we just talked about, what I highlighted, are going to be the challenges in that annual flu shot. You know, how do we design it such that 
A, we're getting a robust antibody response. Should we be adding a little something called an adjuvant? Hmm. Now, sometimes we do this for older people because their immune systems don't respond as robustly, so we actually add like a little tickler for the immune system that tickles it even more. It's called an adjuvant. It, it creates a more robust immune response. Hmm. Should we be adding that in the next iteration of the booster? Should we be just doing monovalence and just looking at the circulating strain? Or, like we do with the flu, should we be predicting and looking ahead at perhaps what the next Next variant or subvariant is going to look like, rather than being reactive to the prior one um, that just circulated. Uh, and then again, the timing of the boosters is also interesting because for some people that have gotten natural infection, the CDC is now saying about three months or so to get the booster. If you've had a natural infection, do we need to study that better? Hmm. You know, do we need to look at longer periods or shorter periods and see how those boost your immune system and Im immune response as well? Yeah. Yeah, so it's an on-the-fly thing. We're still, f the, you know, the scientific community is still figuring this out. Um, with that said, uh, we're about three years into the pandemic. Where are we at with it broadly right now in terms of cases, uh, the severity of it, and any possible new variants that could be of concern? The biggest one that we really seem to be talking about right now in terms of subvariants is the XBB. Uh, it's a Scrabble variant because it's got lots of letters in it. Um, and, you know, just like we like to say that we're smarter than our parents, this variant is a next generation variant of the Omicron variant. And it is smarter than the parent Omicron variant, smarter at evading our immune system. In fact, it's considered the smartest variant yet in terms of how well it evades our immune system. Um, and that's, that's because it's got all these tricks up its sleeve to disguise itself, to trick our antibodies, to trick our immune cells, which makes it highly infectious. Hmm. So this is one of the more infectious variants we've seen. That's why we expect that it's going to become dominant. But the good news is it looks just like its parent in, and acts like its parent in terms of the behavior. So it's still an Omicron variant, which means that the overall illness, thankfully, is still mild. And, you know, we're less likely to end up in the hospital, less likely to get on a ventilator like we did with prior variants, such as the Delta variant, because this is an Omicron subvariant. Those bivalent boosters would, of course, protect against this because it is derived from that same lineage of variants. Um, but because it's spreading so efficiently and it has that kind of immune escape features, we could get infected again and again. And we could get infected even if we've been vaccinated. So that's why it's really important for all of us to keep our guard up, you know, as we're sort of heading into the fact that the public health emergency is going to go away because we may have less access to tests and treatments and such. So we should still be wearing our masks in public places. That's what I'm doing. We should still, you know, have a very low threshold to get ourselves tested frequently if we have any symptoms. And in terms of you mentioned the Omicron subvariant, mostly mostly uh, mild illness. Is there a concern that we could get another variant that is more aggressive or could produce more severe illness? For sure, because infection begets variants. So the more infections we have, the more chances the virus has to divide in, in hosts and hmm. the more chances it has to, to mutate. Now, thankfully, it's mutated in, in our favor and, and it's become milder. But certainly, one of these mutations could go awry if we keep having widespread infection and actually cause vaccine resistance altogether, cause Paxlovid resistance. We already know that some of the mutations that these newer variants have have made them resistant to the monoclonal antibodies treatment. So that's actually been revoked as a treatment for many of the new variants because it, it doesn't work anymore. So as the virus continues to evolve, and we're giving it a platform to evolve by allowing it to spread, we really have to be careful because it doesn't mean everything's over. The next trick up the sleeve of the virus could be a more deadly one. So how should we be thinking about COVID all uh, overall right now, especially maybe compared to a year or two ago? You know, I think we have shifted from the pandemic to the endemic mode in the sense that there is a kind of a stable background rate. We're not seeing a, a shortage of hospital resources. We're not seeing, you know, significant increases in numbers of people who are getting hospitalized or getting on ventilators or not having availability of hospital resources. So all of that tells me that we're what I would call a steady state. But that doesn't mean the steady state is low. It means the levels are still very, very high. Hmm. And, and hopefully, as time goes on and more of us either get infected and recover or get, you know, the bivalent booster or both, we will start to have 
baseline levels of immunity that will offer cross protection. So even if we have a cousin of you know the Omicron variant or something originate, we would still have cross protection. But again, without a necessarily a guarantee of that, especially with a brand new virus, not knowing what it's going to do scientifically, one of the best things we can do is continue to do those mitigation measures. Make sure we're washing our hands, not touching our face. Public places, you've got to wear those masks. I still wear it on airplanes. I wear it in the grocery store and shopping malls. It's become part of my daily routine. And I think that that has been a good impact of the pandemic on changing our behaviors because for the longest time we've sort of, you know, we, we, buckle down and learn something and then when it's over we forget how hard it was mm. but i want us to not forget because i want all those lives that were lost to not be in vain i want all the suffering that all of us endured as a community to actually have an impact teach us something about science about prevention and really help empower us to get our vaccines and to make sure we're doing those mitigation measures sounds like good advice overall any final thoughts on this uh, no, I would just say that, you know, one of the biggest lessons for me personally has been the power of prevention. And one of the biggest lessons for me professionally has been humility in this pandemic and not taking anything for granted, whether it's our way of life or the scientific process or, you know, the power of the, the virus. It's a, a tiny microscopic thing, but the way that it changed our lives has left a, a lasting impact on me. And, and I hope for all my fellow Americans, they take away the same message that we learn, we heal. This is time for damage control now because we've lived through a traumatic event. This is going to go down in the history books and each of us has actually lived through it. So hopefully we can take some important lessons that we can you know, help to sort of mitigate any kind of future risk and also change our behaviors, maintain a healthy lifestyle, take all the nice silver linings from what we've lived through. Absolutely. Uh, something we've all lived through and something, you know, we're just still freshly from it, but still kind of processing some of those lessons, I suppose. But Dr. Coley, thank you so much for taking your time and uh, sharing us some of your expertise with us today. Thanks for having me, Chris.